Although it's been over a decade since the space shuttle flew, it still casts a long shadow over human space exploration. Uh, there are toys, there's Lego sets, um, and there are plenty of documentaries and books that have come out. And a new book is written by Tom Jones. He's an astronaut that flew on the space shuttle four times. And he has a new book called Space Shuttle Stories. He had a chance to talk with over 100 astronauts, sort of covering interesting stories from each one of the 135 missions that the space shuttle flew, some of which ended in disaster. So uh, enjoy this conversation with astronaut Tom Jones. You know, I think a lot of people have, have questions about the space shuttle, about like what role it played in space exploration, but just like at the heart of it, you know, why is it such a kind of incredible feat of human engineering? Well, the space shuttle was a big leap forward technologically, and so it had a 30-year career, and it, we were a dozen years removed from the retirement of the shuttle. So it's probably a good idea to spend some time talking about what, why it was important and why it was conceived in the first place. You know, we had Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo with the lunar landings, and then NASA envisioned the space shuttle as its reusable system that would lower the cost of operations and allow NASA to free up funds from a shrinking budget so that it could build a space station, so that it could put together a spacecraft that could return to the moon and then continue on to deep space exploration. So the, the agency viewed the shuttle as the ticket for its future. And then, of course, reality intervened and NASA's budget continued to decline in the late 60s, early 70s. And so they could only afford the shuttle. They couldn't build the space station in parallel with it and get or get on with it right away anyway. So what they got from the Office of Management and Budget during the Nixon administration was a promise to build the space shuttle. And the only way they could make it, um, the only way they could afford the development costs in the early 70s and up to its launch in 1981 was to partner with the Air Force and the intelligence agencies who needed their big reconnaissance and uh, communications and missile warning satellites launched. And NASA said, we'll take over launching them for you if you'll chip in some of the development money. And so to make a long story short, throughout the 1970s, NASA struggled to build this new revolutionary space plane, a reusable spacecraft, with the help of the Air Force and the partner uh, intelligence agencies. And it took a long time for that the technological improvements to actually come online. NASA underestimated how difficult it would be to build a reusable spacecraft with wheels, with wings that could fly back from orbit, do a hypersonic re-entry and land on a runway. So it was a major technological step forward. You, you know, you remember the, the heat shield tiles that had to be invented to make the space shuttle a reality. And it also had to have flight computers that could handle the hypersonic flight regime as well as land in a glide for a one-time only attempt on a runway landing. And then there were the sophisticated advances in operating in orbit where you had payload bay doors that had to open up and a robot arm that had to come out and an airlock that had to support spacewalk. So all these were new innovations that had to be all combined and made to function properly. Probably the biggest challenge were the main engines that were used to uh, propel the, the space shuttle orbiter into orbit, drinking fuel from the big external fuel tank. And those were like Swiss watches. Reusable rocket engines, yes, but they were very very finely tuned and required uh, a thorough going over between each mission, which meant they cost a lot of money to reuse. So the space shuttle was a big leap forward, but it wasn't the DC-3 of space travel. It wasn't the airliner-like operation that everybody had envisioned in the 1970s. And in the end, it did teach us everything that we know how to do well in space. It was our classroom in space for 30 years that gave us the confidence and the skills to go back to the moon now, or, or to build the International Space Station for that matter. Um, but it was never economical and it was never reliable in the sense of an airliner. In fact, it was an experimental airplane all the way through. And because of that, uh, that use of cutting edge technology and the, and the fact that it was operating on the very edge of what we knew how to do technologically, you know, we lost two shuttles and two shuttle crews. And so that's an inescapable fact of the shuttle's design. It was very advanced, but also an experimental craft from start to finish. It's interesting to me when you, like, we're recording this theoretically days away before SpaceX does another test of the Starship. 
and designed to be the first fully reusable two-stage rocket. And yet when you go back to those original design requirements of shuttle, it was a fully reusable two-stage rocket, except both parts would would glide back to and make a and make a landing. And and you know, these ideas that that we're seeing now with with various rocket companies had already been thought of back in the 60s and 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 70s. Was it was it budget? Was it technology? Or was it just that it was just too complicated to sort of carry out all of the pieces? Do you think we could have had that fully reusable two-stage flying shuttle with the two parts that separated? I love those pictures. Yes. And I write about this in the book, Space Shuttle Stories, about the early de- development. The early plans were to have a fully reusable system, as you say, with a flyback booster with a crew on it. They would go up to 6,000 miles per hour and then you know, get rid of the orbiter and let it go on into space. They'd come back and do a, a jet-powered runway landing. Um, and then on top of the, the, the back of that booster would be the orbiter that would carry the main payload into orbit, and it would be fully reusable as well. Uh, but it just proved to be too expensive to develop with the limited budget that NASA had. And uh, it was also going to be daunting technology. These were huge spacecraft uh, and flying at... 6,000 miles an hour uh, meant that your uh, booster had to go through almost the same flight environment as the orbiter did. So it had to be, it had to have a heat shield. It had to be um, uh, uh, manhandled back to the runway, even though it was bigger than a Boeing 747. And, you know, I wouldn't put past anybody who could build the Saturn V that they wouldn't be able to build the, that two-stage reusable system, but it proved to be too expensive to put together. So NASA and its cost-cutting uh, revisions of the shuttle's design. First of all, they got uh, they got rid of the whole flyback booster concept with a manned crew, and they said, "Okay, well, first we're going to put liquid fuel boosters on there." Well, they were going to be too expensive to develop, so to simplify and lower the development costs, they went to these solid rocket motors, bigger than any had flown before. They'd use some on the Titan system, but these were going to be even bigger and higher performance. So they went to solid rocket motors to lower the development costs, and then they said uh, instead of that flyback booster, we're going to put all of the oomph in the orbiter's fuel tank, that external tank. And so those main engines on the orbiter would perform longer from launch all the way to orbit. And then give the necess- that would give the necessary velocity to, to achieve orbit. So they just remixed the system uh, to lower the development costs. And uh, what that meant was the external tank was throwaway. And so it was going to be more expensive. And then the boosters, even though they were cheaper to develop, they cost more in terms of um, refurbishment and uh, the operations overhauls that the operational overhauls that had to be done on those boosters meant that the long run out cost was more expensive than the liquid fuel boosters would have had. So um, it was a compromise recognizing that they wouldn't get the shuttle built at all if they didn't lower the cost of the development. But I think about that refurbishment of the of the solid rocket boosters and the refurbishment that had to be done on the orbiter itself. I mean, there was a lot of work to be done after every flight. As you said, they had those heat tiles, they had to be repaired and inspected very carefully. I wonder if the companies that are going for fully reusable two-stage rocketry have a whole bunch of reliability refurbishment tasks ahead of them that they're not expecting. Well, I'm not the expert to tell you how what the internal plans of SpaceX or Blue Origin are, but I think yeah. they're going to find some surprises. Any names. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's how I, I wonder. They'll find yeah. some surprises yeah. because they're going to have large heat shields on those recoverable second stages. It's very difficult to come back from uh, almost orbital velocity and then recover the system. And you know, the shuttle had you know silicon-based uh, insulating and heat rejection tiles in its heat shield. Those black tiles that are so famous and infamous. Um, but, uh, whatever system that those other companies choose, and I think the Starship, for example, has those same kind of silicon tiles, but probably, um, they, you know, Elon's company has found a way to manufacture them more cheaply than NASA ever did. That's that's probably what they're counting on. Um, but yeah, they're going to be in a rugged environment and it'll be interesting to see how they maintain and refurbish not only the heat shield tiles, but the, the reusable engines that they're going to be, um, putting to use. And then, you know, the shuttle systems uh, had to be inspected and gone over with a fine tooth comb from nose to tail after every flight. And it's going to be hard initially for, uh, to, to make the jump to uh, an airliner type pre-flight inspection that you would do before you fly again. 
I think they'll find some surprises and um, maybe they won't turn their budget into the black as quickly as they think they will. One of my favorite parts of the space shuttle are those engines. Um, they are some of the highest performing engines I think humanity has, has ever built. Uh, what was it like to be strapped in inside the shuttle and experience the, the liftoff? Well, those, those engines are very impressive. You know, I always had the, the, the vision that in my head, I remembered from a, a briefing I had in astronaut training that the three engines running together could drain a, a Olympic sized swimming pool in about 30 seconds. Uh, they just suck those propellants out of the external tank. And so when you think of that big brown tank, it's, it's multiple Olympic swimming pools full of <laughs> rocket fuel that get fed to those engines for eight and a half minutes. So the engines were a big worry all the way through the shuttle program uh, because they are so high performance, their materials were so advanced and exotic. And if one of them went kablooey, it would probably take out the other two and basically blow the back end off the orbiter. And there was no surviving a situation like that. So they all three had to work like the Swiss watches that they were uh, to achieve orbit. And their efficiency was what enabled the shuttle to put a usable payload in orbit of some 30,000 uh, some, some 30, pounds plus. So those engines were a major, they were the core of the space shuttle's design, if you will. And But the fact is that in 30 years, they only lost one engine on the way to orbit. And so they did turn out to be super reliable, even though they got a lot of attention as critical systems. After the Challenger accident in 1986, NASA went over the, the engine design with the manufacturer, um, uh, Rocketdyne, with a fine tooth comb. And uh, they found ways that they could improve the reliability and improve the processing time of the engines and, and eliminate some of the critical failure modes of the engine. So they used that downtime after Challenger to improve the engine performance. And um, from, from 1986 on, they never had an engine failure. They had a couple of close calls, but never an engine failure. So what tr was most worrisome about the whole shuttle system, the engines, turned out to be one of the most reliable parts of it in the end. And I think they were continuously able to increase the efficiency of the engines through the lifetime of the shuttle. Like I think by the end, they were, you know, they were able to go above 100%. Uh, what's 109? Sure. I yeah, they the increased final the, output the, was. It was incredible. Yeah, 109% was the emergency power level that you would use during aborts, but you routine, routinely flew at 104, 104% uh, of rated thrust. And so the, the manufacturer with NASA went through a whole testing program and, and component improvement program to certify those higher thrust modes of the engine. And so, yes, they, they proved to be you know, more efficient and provide a higher thrust to increase the payload than originally envisioned. And you know, the fact that they did that um, is why they're being used as the main engines on the space launch system now, because it's such an efficient design and they're, they're, they're well understood and they have a 30 year track record to rely on. Doesn't mean that one's not gonna fail in the future, but they're, they're gonna use a very proven system to help that moon rocket get off the ground. Although they need to reuse them, not to not reuse them means they don't have to be quite so careful and they can even push them a little harder, I think. Yes, and they, because of that approach of not reusing the engines, um, they're going to, of course, be turning out new versions of the engine that save cost by going to one-time only use components, and so they'll save in the manufacturing costs, and then there won't be any, there won't be any of, any of the inspections for a turnaround because they won't recover them. Right. You know, and that's against the philosophy of reusing systems, which is the the twenty first century approach, obviously. But in some cases, the economics tell you to just throw it away. Yeah. Yeah. It is going to be heartbreaking to see those things go into the ocean, but yeah, the particularly time, they'll be, they'll be throwing my engines that I flew on into the ocean. That's yes. somewhat emotional for me. Yeah. I mean, they already have thrown some of them. They've got four have gone and now there's the next four are, are, are due to launch. So let's talk about the book. You had a chance to interview just a ton of your colleagues. How many astronauts did you end up talking with? I think I counted up 130 or more, um, and I, I could look in the back of the book and tell you exactly how many. Right. But it was more but, than but 130. But that matches. But that that's close to matching the number of flights that the shuttle did. Yeah. Well, the whole conceit of the book was for me to talk to one astronaut and get a story from one astronaut from every one of the shuttle missions, and not use the same people. 
So I wanted That's amazing. as many voices as I could get. And so yeah. in the end, yeah, I'm in there a couple of times for two different missions. So I cheated on that part. And I think in a couple of cases, the stories I got from my colleagues and friends as I talked to them were germane to more than one mission. So I would take a snippet of their interview and put it into another um, uh, astronaut tale from another, just a different uh, commentary to add a little perspective. So uh, it's not true that it, there's just one voice from each mission. There's a couple of multiples in there, but it's close to one individual voice from each of the 135 missions. And you know what the biggest kick for me was, was that I talked to a lot of people who I only knew um, on a passing basis, you know, especially the guys who flew in the 80s who might have retired before I got to the astronaut corps in 1990. And so I got a chance to actually pick their brains for 45 minutes or an hour and, and learn about the, the ins and outs of their particular mission. And so that was a great pleasure and a privilege to get to sit down with people as if we were having a beer together and sharing some good space stories. And in the work environment in Houston and the astronaut corps, you never had the chance to do that. It, we, everybody was too busy going off on their own missions or training for their mission or supporting somebody else who was flying. So you never got much chance to have a social environment to exchange stories. And this was a real pleasure for me to go and talk to, you know, over a hundred individuals and, and hear their, their, their emotions and their f fears and worries about their missions. It was really a, a treat. I mean, Every chance I get a chance to talk to an astronaut, uh, you know, right now, for example, um, I'm like, okay, I get it why they're an astronaut. It, there's, there's obviously the kind of the technical training, whether they come from the Air Force military, you know, they come from the flying side or they come from the scientific background. There is a sort of multidisciplinary capability. And then at the same time, on top of that, there is a personality that is that allows them to work together in, in crises. And so you could be sitting and having a beer with one of them, and you can have these really fascinating conversations. It must have been such a delight to just have these kinds of conversations over 130 times with so many of your colleagues. The best part of the astronaut job was the people. And you don't think about the space program as being a people-oriented enterprise, but it didn't function without the people. You had the mission controllers, you had our trainers and instructors, you had all the engineers who backed up the systems and developed and, and improved them over time. And so all of the folks are part of a big team and they're all people. And what amazed me about my work uh, for 11 years as an astronaut was the creativity level and the intelligent le intelligence level and the sense of humor that people had. And so the and they were also bright and also united in the pursuit of exploration. Everybody believed that they were exploring and pushing back the frontiers of knowledge. And that's what motivated people to risk their lives to do that. So um, walking away from that job, I think for any astronaut is the hardest part is you leave those people behind. You don't get to see them as frequently as you did before. So that was tough to turn away from. And so the chance to sit down with 130 plus astronauts and talk about their missions was really a, a delight because I got to immerse myself in the world of the astronauts once again. But, but you had similar experiences. And so it's that sharing process where you get to, ch to chat with them. They reveal insights on their missions. That reminds me of the things that happened to you. And yeah, I can just imagine. I would have loved to have. I mean, I guess reading the book, I get to be a fly on the wall of, of, that, of that process. So let's talk about some of these stories. And, you know, I'd like you to just pick a story that that either of your own or one that was relayed to you that I think people might find really meaningful? Well, there were a, a number of themes that I, that, I, that I came to understand as I developed the book and edited it. And so, you know, there's lots of funny stories and I could tell you an hour's worth of funny stories, but there was a lot of drama too. And I didn't perceive, even as an astronaut myself, I didn't understand and perceive the risk that a lot of the other crews had faced in performing their mission. So that, that drama was very uh, touching and, and emotional. So a good example would have been STS-27. It's the, it's the second flight after the Challenger disaster. So we returned to flight and this STS-27 mission was a Department of Defense mission. Hoot Gibson was the commander and they got to space. And um, during the ascent, the right tip of the solid rocket motor, the right solid rocket motor, the tip had disintegrated under air loads. And so the debris from the disintegrating nose cone fell back and struck the right underside of the orbiter. Of course, nobody saw that or felt it during the ascent, but uh, 
camera footage detected it back on the ground as they looked at the film. And so they radioed up from Houston and said, hey, we would like you to take the robot arm and look at the, the upper right wing just below the cockpit and tell us what you see on the underside of the right wing. And when the crew um, got the arm out and deployed it and turned on the TV camera, the first time they looked at the TV monitors in the cabin, um, Hoot Gibson says in his uh, reminiscence that uh, he looked at the TV screen and he said, we're all going to die because the hundreds of tiles had been damaged by that debris striking the orbiter. And with the limitations of the TV on the robot arm, it's a, a, you know, a somewhat grainy and it wasn't high resolution and the lighting wasn't perfect and so on. Um, even with that, they could tell that they had sustained some serious damage. So Hoot and the crew told the ground about this and they t- downlinked some of the video. But unfortunately, because it was a classified mission, they had encryption systems in the communications link that degraded the video perhaps so that mission control didn't really see the full fidelity of what the crew was seeing. And they came back to the crew with a stunning advice that, oh, it all looks good to us and you're certified for a normal reentry. And they couldn't understand why they weren't more worried about what they were obviously seeing on this video. So there were some communications gaps that the crew had to deal with and try to understand. But in the end, you have to come home. And there was no alternative about sending a rescue shuttle up or doing some spacewalks. There was no repair technique to patch damaged tiles at that point. So they had to come home. And so Hoot tells the story about how all the way during reentry, he had in the back of his mind, I, we might be seeing any second now the, the critical traces of this damage that are going to spin us out of control and we'll, we'll lose our lives here. And I think the thing that I admire most about that story is that Hoot did not dump all of this worry and anxiety on the rest of the crew members. He just said, okay, we're going to do, what we, we're going to do our jobs and we're going to watch everything, but don't worry about it. You know, we're going to do our jobs and we'll come through. And so I don't think Guy Gardner, who told me most of the story of this mission as the pilot, I don't think he was as concerned about losing his life as Hoot was, but Hoot's right up front in his interview on video about this. And he says that uh, um, it was nerve wracking to watch the shuttle perform all the way through reentry and wonder if this was the last 30 seconds of the flight. Uh, When they got on the ground, they uh, found that one pile was completely missing and the plasma heat had almost burned through the skin of the orbiter at that point. So they came very close to a penetration of hot gas into the orbiter. And if it had hit some critical subsystem, they might have you know, gone out of control. So and experienced what Columbia did in 2003. And that's what I was going to say is like, you know, we have the hindsight of knowing when that goes catastrophically wrong with with Columbia. If they had lost another orbiter after the Challenger, that would have been it. Like there's no way those things would have kept flying. Yeah, and, two losses in three flights, that would have been the end of the shuttle program. And for a long time, it would have been the end of U- U.S. human space flight. So, yeah. uh, but the tragic thing about it was that even despite the damage, and there are pictures of the crew standing on the runway looking at the damage with shock on their faces and the same on the, the ground support crew there, everybody was astounded at the damage that the shuttle had sustained. About 600 tiles, I think, were damaged, including the one that was fully missing. They were very lucky. But you know, by 2003, NASA had forgotten about that and how close that shuttle came to being lost. And so when they observed the ascent damage to Columbia, they saw the impact, but couldn't identify the damage from the ground. And they did not treat that potential of a catastrophe with the seriousness that it deserved. And uh, while it would have been very difficult to rescue the Columbia crew, there was at least a small chance of making that attempt. And Yet that was never considered at the time in 2003 because we'd forgotten how close we'd come and people didn't view foam impact to the heat shield as something that could be a catastrophe. Now, how did you handle the disasters? Because obviously, you know, there's well, no you know, I wanted a story. Those. Yes, I wanted a story or a voice from every one of the missions. And so I've got two lost shuttle crews and that I've got to, I've got to have some way of capturing their voices. So um, I knew all of the... Columbia astronauts on STS-107. And so I knew that, uh, like for my missions, NASA had done an interview with each of them before the launch where they get to talk about their flight for their upcoming flight for an hour. And so I could have mined all of those video snippets for the voices of the Columbia crew. Um, I'll come back to that. Back to the Challenger crew in 1986, 
Uh, NASA did not do such extensive pre-flight recordings uh, with the crew members for publicity purposes. So all I could rely on from the 1986 uh, crew was to look for newspaper interviews that they had done. I found some YouTube videos where you know Judy Resnick had appeared on NBC to talk about a previous shuttle mission and just talk to Tom Brokaw about you know her astronaut career. So there were some snippets and clips of the Challenger STS-51L crew. Um, and then they came to the Cape right before flight and they did an arrival press conference. And you know the NASA, the NASA press conference for that crew on Challenger was very technical. It didn't have a lot of personality to it. They just talked about the goals of the mission and, and how they would carry out the technical tasks. But when they arrive at the Cape, they're exuberant. They're, bound, they're bouncing out of their jets, getting ready to go to the launch pad and the crew quarters. And so they, they did reveal some of their personalities there. So what I did for Challenger was based on some of the media interviews and some of that arrival footage, I got the, a voice from each of the seven crew members that I could put on the printed page to let them speak. Then now we're going to go back to, to Columbia. Uh, in the case of the Columbia crew, I could have done the same thing and had seven different voices talking. But Laurel Clark, God bless her, she was my friend and she worked for me on the space station project. Um, she sent an email from Columbia down to her family and friends and was within about two days, I guess, of reentry. And so in Laurel's email, she talks so openly about how joyful the crew is and how much they've enjoyed the science research and how astounding the view is out the window. And so she talks about how uh, satisfying it is to work as a group and a, a group of friends up there. And so everything that the seven crew members could have said about their mission was, is encapsulated in what Laurel wrote in that email. So I just used her email to represent the Columbia crew. And I think it stands up well for them all. Um, so that was the solution for me. And I was very glad that my friend got to, you know, contribute her voice to this project. So let's hear, let's hear a happy story now. <laughs> there are lots of them. Um, every, I think in, in a lot of the stories you'll get in reading the astronauts' contribution, you'll get the sense of satisfaction that, that they've done a job well together as a team and that they've worked with the mission control folks on the ground or the scientific sponsors of their mission and achieve the mission goals. So that satisfaction comes through. And I've experienced that myself. There's nothing that equals the professional high that I got near the end of each mission when we were basically buttoning up the orbiter and getting ready to come home with the mission in the bag, with all the science work done or the construction work on the International Space Station done. So I, I think those emotional highs are, are captured in the book. Um, but there's just a lot of uh, happy stories too. There's, you know, I think one of my favorites is um, Barbara Morgan, who flew on SCS 118, I believe. So she flew once as a mission specialist, but she was Krista McAuliffe's backup as the teacher in space candidate for that STS 51L mission on Challenger. So, you know, the Challenger crew was lost in 1986. Barbara came on board in the late 1990s and was hired as a professional astronaut because of her biology background and teaching experience. They made her a professional astronaut, a mission specialist, so she gets to fly. And in a sense, on STS-118, she views her mission not only to accomplish the space station technical goals that they had, but to complete the mission of the teacher in space program. And so Barbara gets to talk about in her story about how she with NASA lived up to their end of the partnership agreement they had with Krista and the other teacher in space candidates that, that was begun way back in the mid 1980s. So she on her flight takes up um, a million basil seeds and they're going to distribute those and they have been distributed to students and teachers around the country. I think they reached something on the order of um, you know, 50,000 teachers around the country received sample packets of these seeds. Then the students got to design growth chambers and raise space flown seeds and compare them with ground flown basil seeds. They're very easy to grow those little herbs, you know. And so everybody got a taste of doing research in space by distributing those million seeds. <laughs> and she said when um, uh, her, her crewmate pulled out the packet of basil seeds from the locker on the space shuttle, you got this immediate aroma of that herb, that aromatic herb smell going throughout the cabin. 
And it was Al Drew who pulled the packet out to take some video. But in doing so, he unleashed this aroma. And he, Al, Al Drew turned to Barbara and said, God, I could just kill for some lasagna right now. And so, you know, it was the satisfaction of having the student experiment, you know, come to fruition on board STS-118, but also just the fun of having this aromatic experience in space, which is very rare in that, in that antiseptic, heavily filtered environment on the shuttle. So I thought that was a nice story. And Barbara obviously felt very great satisfaction and joy at completing Krista's um, teaching in space mission. One of the themes that keeps coming up is this idea of the overview effect, that something about being in space, seeing the planet without its borders, is very deeply affecting to astronauts. Did you get a sense from people that that was very long-lasting for them? Of course. I think anybody who goes to space is moved by the view that they experience of the Earth, their home planet. And you get to see it from a few hundred miles up. You know, we didn't experience on the shuttle the dramatic view that the Apollo astronauts had, but we got to spend several weeks looking at our home planet up close. And I think that um, gives you more time to absorb the impressions of our home. So I, just like me, everybody is inspired. It's like a, it's like a, a sunrise on a mountaintop times 100 when you're up there in terms of the emotional beauty, the emotional impact of that beauty. So that comes through in a lot of the stories and people will tell the story that they're out on a spacewalk and they get to experience the view of the cosmos and the planet at the same time without the, the, the window frame in view. And then just looking out the window though, you do get these fantastic sunrises and sunsets. And the beauty of that comes across. Some people treat it as a spiritual experience and, you know, and they get, they feel, feel closer to God because of that view that they get. And other people just, just take it just for the raw beauty. And they just say, what a marvel for a human being to perceive this scene uh, and what a treat it is for me individually to have that gift. So it's just, a, it's a theme that comes through and everybody I think comes back. I think one of the astronauts tells us in the book that, you know, if you're not an environmentalist, when you go into space, you come back as one. Yeah, it, it is interesting. Like I, even like when William Shatner did his suborbital flight on a Blue Origin just a couple of years ago, he came back and you could just see how emotionally moved he was. Just, you know, he spent a few minutes of free fall and then and saw the earth, the curvature of the earth briefly and then came back to earth. And yet he was transformed by the experience. And, and it is definitely a common thread that I've talked to, to astronauts and that feeling that this planet is special and precious. And this is the only one that we've got. And you, it's only when you're up in space that you can just get it all in your eyeballs at the same time. And there's something to it. I, you know, I hope more people get a chance to experience that. That's true. And um, as, as thousands of people go into space in the next few decades, you know, they're going to, we're going to hear more and more from people about how their lives were changed by that experience. And, you know, I think people take their personalities and beliefs and, and perceptions of the earth with them as they go up there. And I don't think they're radically changed, but I think it just doesn't, it enhances your personal understanding of, of this world that we come from and its value. One of the sort of big jobs of the space shuttle was to help with the construction of the International Space Station, which is amazing. It's been continuously inhabited now since it was built 24 years ago, 23. Like there's been people in space all the time. For now. 22 um, years. Yeah. 22 years. Yeah. Continually yeah, inhabited. Yeah. Amazing. Um, do you have some stories about what it was like to be working on the construction of the space station? That's the ultimate job for the space shuttle. It was conceived to build the space station, and we finally got around to using it for that purpose, you know, in the 1990s with the International Space Station. And what a, a twist of fate it was that the Russians were brought in to be major partners as well. So the space shuttle got to fulfill its destiny, if you will, uh, starting in 1998 when the first component was lofted up by the Russians, and then soon after the shuttle Endeavour on STS-88 went in to start the construction. Um, and uh, put up the first component, the Unity node. So um, a lot, about a third of the book probably is devoted to these missions that were focused on space station construction. And it went together like a jigsaw puzzle. And some pieces were absolutely critical. There were the one of a kind uh, laboratory modules like the Destiny lab that my crew delivered for the US um, that's still the brains, the nerve center of the space station today. And uh, so much was riding on each of those individual delivery and construction missions that, you know, the, the tension on the crew, the pressure on the crew to deliver the job was, was really off the charts. Um, 
And I realized I had no prayer of doing it by myself. One of the realizations I got on STS-98 to deliver the Destiny Science Lab was that no chance that I'm going to do anything like this by myself. I need my four crewmates and all of us have to work superbly as a team with the folks in Mission Control and the Moscow Control Center to get the work done. So everybody had to be playing their integrated part in that journey. So that comes across in the book. And it's astounding to me how we put this million pound complex up there in orbit. Um, it's been designed for a 15 year life and yet it's been up there for with a crew on board for 22 years. So it's exceeded ex expectations. We've got four laboratories clicking up there. It's truly an amazing technolog technological achievement and it involved these 15 countries. So it's the largest international technical achievement in history in terms of the expense and the complexity. And it's a role model for how we might deal with other problems that confront us as a global society. So it's a, it's a great testimony to how nations can work together to pull off some very complex achievements. And so, you know, when we deal with energy or climate change or something like that, this is a good role model for that. So I think um, the, the shuttle uh, has a great big part in that happy ending of the space station. And it's, a, it's, it's proven that cooperation at that scale can work. And so we can expect to go as a coalition to back to the moon and then work together to afford and build a program to get us to Mars and pursue life out there. So it's a great, uh, it's a great springboard that the shuttle gave us off to the future in deep space. Um, and then of course, some of the other big things that it did was the launch and repair of the Hubble Space Telescope. I've got to assume you you talked to Mike Massimo and some of the other people who were involved in that mission. Right. You know, who could have believed that we would have been able to do brain surgery on the Hubble telescope? And first yeah. of all, it was just to correct the faulty optics that were built by mistake into the main mirror on Hubble. And we managed with uh, a, an amazing set of five spacewalks on STS-61 to correct the optics with an ingenious installation of some corrective mirrors that were designed on the ground by um, the Hubble project. And then those were installed by the spacewalking crews and the, and the support crew on the, on the shuttle and got that into place and redeemed the error that had been built into Hubble. But then we've been able to upgrade over the five servicing missions, upgrade the systems and the instruments on the Hubble so that it, it was still a, um, a cutting edge science instrument even um, as the shuttle retired. And it's been going, I guess it was like 2011 or so, when the, or 2010 when the last servicing mission went up, and it's still going strong. I think it, it, we've lost a few gyros, but it's still got some, some life, and it's still doing cutting edge science. So it's an, it's an amazing achievement. Yeah, and there are plans in the works now to potentially even boost it again, maybe do another repair on it. Um, there's a private uh, Polaris mission that's in negotiations with NASA to provide that. And and it, it really will sort of feel like the end of an era when the Hubble Space Telescope finally comes to an end. But it's just it's like just been around for so long and done so much science. It's still dramatically oversubscribed by by astronomers. Like they all want to get their hands on it. Um, so you know we're in this new era of space flight now that the NASA is working with SpaceX to be able to do the Crew Dragon. Uh, did you get a chance to talk to some astronauts, sort of get their perspective on the shuttle versus, say, being on board a, a, a Crew Dragon launch? Be the topic of another book, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you know, given that I had to talk to 130 people and I had to borrow some of their time, of course, they were all very generous with that. I didn't want to extend the interviews to say, hey, tell me about the future and what do you think is going on? So we only talked about that in passing and I didn't put any of that in the book. I, I, I do close the book with a reflection on the shuttle in perspective. And, you know, even though the space shuttle didn't measure up to the reliability and the reusability uh, projections that NASA had for it, it did set the stage for where improvements had to be made. And I think the commercial space companies have taken that to heart. They've borrowed proven NASA technology. They took what worked and then they've saw, they saw where the shuttle fell short, uh, crew safety in one area, for example. And so these new spacecraft are at the top of the rocket where debris can't fall on them. That's, you know, one astronaut used to joke that, you know, the capsule is going to be at the top where God intended it to be. Uh, the shuttle was, of course, flying on the side of the big fuel tank and was subject to debris impacts. So they're not only in the right place in the rocket configuration physically, 
but they've been built with structures that can withstand greater loads, including the firing of abort engines to get away from an exploding booster. So now we've given the crews that ride these astronaut transports a chance to get away from a failing rocket. And the spacecraft is strong enough to stay intact and then deploy its parachutes and lower the crew to a, a gentle landing. So yes, we had that technique back in Apollo and Mercury, and the Russians have used it and escaped from failing rockets uh, throughout um, the career of the Soyuz spacecraft. But now it's been applied, I think, in a smart and efficient and low cost way that allows those spacecraft to be much safer for the crews by at least a factor of 10 over what the shuttle could have provided. So, you know, let's let's learn those lessons from the shuttle and its 30 years of tragedy and triumph and then use those lessons and not forget them so that we um, face the risks going out into deep space intelligently with an understanding of those risks, but with a, a willingness to commit to meeting those challenges and and making the voyage as safe as we can make it. Yeah, it, it is kind of interesting. Like you look at, like after the Challenger, they implemented a bunch of, of safety, new safety techniques to try and help the crew recover. And it was like like a long pole that you would sort of go go out on and hopefully you could sort of ride out outside of the orbiter and, and ditch. Did you Did you get a chance to train on that system? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so I came in after the Challenger accident and four years later. And so by then, the shuttle had started flying again with this limited escape capability. And what it meant was that the crew could put the orbiter into a glide. If it couldn't make it to a runway, the orbiter could go on autopilot into a glide. And then once below 40,000 feet in the atmosphere, you could bail out. And given enough time, everybody could get out, attach themselves to the pole with their parachute harness, roll out of the hatch. The pole would guide them underneath the wing so you wouldn't collide with the orbiter and get killed. And then the chute would open and, you know, you'd have a chance to land on the water. Um, but that meant that orbiter had to be in one piece so you could put it on autopilot and it would glide stably uh, while you were escaping. And so there are a lot of scenarios for the shuttle where the orbiter would not be intact and it would not be able to be put into a stable glide with enough time for anybody to get out. But it, it did provide a way to, you know, deal with one narrow scenario where you just couldn't make it to a runway because of navigation errors or what have you. And so you had some chance to get out, but it wasn't going to do much good during powered ascent. Uh, you know, you had to get the orbiter off of that stack in, in one piece and get it into a glide. And, you know, if something started to come apart during powered flight, that wasn't very likely. So that's the great thing about these commercial uh, systems is that they have full envelope escape capability where no matter what happens with the booster rocket or, you know, uh, in orbit, you can come back home and the spacecraft's going to stay intact and give the crew a chance to, to come back. So, you know, um, that limited escape capability is something I trained for. You know, I wore a parachute. I had my full pressure suit on. Uh, before every launch, but I I did have the the understanding that boy it would have to be a, an extremely lucky day for that escape system to save me and my crewmates. Yeah, yeah, but it, I guess it'd be the alternative that if you're you know not yeah, able and, to ditch and, you know, in, the, in that situation. The, right. If you look at the Challenger accident, um, the crew cabin was mostly intact as the shuttle broke up, and so the seven crew members on Challenger had they had a pressure suit and could stay conscious. Even with the cabin torn free from the orbiter, if they had the equipment that we had, they might have had a chance to get a few people out of that cabin before it impacted the ocean, and they might have saved a few folks. So, you know, it did provide just a, a lifeline towards rescue, but it wasn't very, um, it wasn't very capable across a broad range of performance, and that was just because of cost reasons. You know, to retrofit the shuttle with a complete escape system that could protect you from launch to landing was just not going to be affordable. You'd have to th basically retire the shuttle at that point and then design something better. And NASA didn't have the funds to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could just imagine the all of you know, having something that could separate and could actually push itself away from the rest of the orbiter, a lot of extra weight that would reduce the, the, payload. the payload. I mean, there's just too many compromises to be able to do that. I mean, it always astounds me just how powerful the space shuttle was. I mean, we talk about the capability of the, of the new... SLS rocket and it it can launch an astounding amount into space. The shuttle was roughly the same power. It's just that it had to carry the orbiter as opposed yes. to yes, yeah. If you count the orbiter as part of the payload, it, the, the shuttle system could fling a hundred tons into orbit. So pretty impressive performance. 
but of course the shuttle had to come home again. So the the you know you were limited to something like thirty five to forty thousand pounds of, of payload deployed from the orbiter, and so the shuttle was very powerful. And that's of course that's why it's a risky system because you've got to unleash. Seven million pounds of rocket thrust to get yourself off the pad and, and on the way to orbit, and to unleash all that chemical energy in just eight and a half minutes means that you're on the very hairy edge of what we know how to do in terms of structures and uh, thermal performance and vibration with uh, uh, vibration uh, resistance and so on. So I was truly aware of that kind of power. You know, when you light up the engines on the pad, you're shaking like a skyscraper in an earthquake. Um, it rattles your teeth for about six seconds until the computers decide that all the engines look good and then it lights the boosters. And then, boom, you're propelled off the pad in almost like a cannon shot. And you know, once you get your brain locked back in after a couple of seconds, you see the launch tower just dropping away immediately. And now you're on this really shaky, vibration-filled, but high acceleration ride uh, up through the atmosphere. So about two and a half Gs right after booster ignition. So you're plastered back into your seat and enduring a lot of this vibration. If you look at the camera views of it that later shuttle crews brought back, it doesn't look that violent, but believe me, as a human being, it's it's dynamic and it's very impressive. And you get the sense of all that power coursing through the machine. And then at the very end of the ascent, when you're about 30 seconds from achieving orbit and you realize that the shuttle's main engines are maxed out, they're at full power, sucking the last propellants in the external tank dry. And that machine is accelerating at a phenomenal rate at that point. It's a three Gs of acceleration for the last uh, minute or minute and a half of the ascent. And when you're sitting there being squeezed back into your seat by this system that is just trying to thread the needle in terms of uh, location and velocity to achieve its mission, it's just doing this you know, that's an autopilot brain propelling you towards that point in space and time. And you're just along for the ride in this giant physics experiment. It's really impressive. You know, you feel like you're on the leading edge of a, of a pitcher's fastball <laughs> being hurled towards the batter. Yeah. It, it, again, like I, you know, many years ago when I was sort of a, a, the first time I got a chance to interview an astronaut, I asked them if it was fun. And I realized that was a terrible question to ask. Um, it's terrifying. And, and you have trust, I guess, in the, in the engineers, but at the same time, you're aware of the, of, of the, those who have died in this machine. And, and as you said, a shaking skyscraper. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't use the word terrifying. I don't think any crews were terrified. I think crews were anxious about performing their mission and they were anxious to see the system perform to get them there. It was fun. It was exhilarating. You know, even while you're being rocketed into space, it's, it's the most physically exhilarating experience I've ever had professionally. So, um, but um, Rick Houck in the book talks about the first mission after Challenger. He's the commander of STS-26. And while they're riding uphill, he says, I hope this thing doesn't blow up. That's what he's saying to himself. But then he says, after a split second, he says, well, that's not very productive. Let me just focus on what I'm, I'm here to do. Because I don't have any control over whether it blows up or not. So... You just hope the guys on the ground did their job and you trust that they did 101% of the, the jobs that they had to do. So the machine's going to operate the way it was designed. So um, it was, it was, you were aware of the risk intellectually, but as a human being, you can't fail to be impressed by the ride that it's giving you. It's just awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tom, the book again, if people want to pick it up, why don't you show the, show a copy of the book and give us the title again. Space Shuttle Stories. It's from Smithsonian Books. Just came out on October 31st. It's um, heavily illustrated, profusely illustrated with over 600 pictures that I helped choose and the astronauts who contributed their stories helped me choose. So you'll see some never before published images of uh, these missions underway. And they're the favorites of the astronauts that I talked to. They, they were the ones who suggested, hey, this is, this is a picture that tells the story of what we were doing up there. And I think it's unique. It, it's a historically important book because it captures the voices of the astronauts from that 30-year career of the shuttle before we lose some of them to time. And uh, we've already lost a lot of shuttle flyers to time. And I would like to hope that this book will crystallize those views. Um, you know, We've already lost two of the astronauts who contributed to the book. Um, to uh, uh, the passage of time. So I hope people will enjoy this voice, these voices, and I hope they'll remember the lessons that they taught us 
as we go back to the moon and on to Mars. Yeah, it's a beautiful book, as you said. The pictures are stunning, and you know, I've been reporting this for twenty five years, and there was tons and tons of stories that I had never heard insights into into how the shuttle operated, the kinds of dynamics of the crew, the tasks that they were doing, and some of the conclusions that they were making. So I'm really glad somebody was able to get those stories out of all of those people involved. So thank you so much. It was a privilege to get to work on this project, and I'm glad it, uh, it's finally out there for everybody to enjoy. All right, good luck. And I look forward to the next book where you interview everybody who flies on all the other vehicles. All right, I'll look forward to that too. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Fraser. I'm going to talk about the space shuttle some more, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shipplin, Monzo, George, David Gilton, Andrew M. Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. The space shuttle has a very special connection for me, which is that it is my spaceship. When I was 10 years old, my father woke me up early in the morning to watch the first space shuttle launch. He was a child of the Apollo era. He watched the first people set foot on the moon. And although I was born like right before the end of the Apollo mission, I don't remember it. But I do remember the space shuttle. And so we watched that first space shuttle launch. And then that was one of the foundational memories that helped get me so excited and enthusiastic about space exploration. And I was able to partially pay it back to my father. He's a photographer, professional photographer. And so he joined me for a trip to the Kennedy Space Center where we were going to hope to see the second to last launch of the space shuttle. And unfortunately, they had a launch delay. You know, I always say one does not book a return flight from a rocket launch. Well, it happened. So, but we got close to the space shuttle. We got to see the Kennedy Space Center, and it was amazing to be able to share this with my father, to be there and see all of this history that we enjoyed together. So, uh, now we're sort of changing into a new era with spaceflight. We're pushing into the Artemis era. And so, Artemis 1 has already flown, and we did a really long, in depth sort of overview of everything happened during the Artemis 1 mission. So, Here's a link to that video now.